Chapter 26, Zenith. The fate of Equestria does not rest on me making friends. Zebras. Equestria's enemies, the creatures who slaughtered us by the millions and destroyed our lands with poisoned clouds and balefire bombs. The creatures were constantly portrayed as demonic, nightmarish, virtually without souls. Creatures who, according to the propaganda of the Ministry of Image, embodied the antithesis of pony virtues. Yeah, I thought, looking out over the caged area where ponies murdered each other brutally for the sport of slaves. Because we ponies are so noble. Was it fair to paint Zenith with all the wrongdoings of the members of her race centuries dead? No more than so to blame me for the things ponies must have done to them. I had my own sins to bear the guilt for. And now, assuming the raider buck named Daffodil didn't strike her down, I was expected to fight this zebra. And either kill her, or die by her hooves. More likely the latter. I had been stripped of everything I could use as a weapon. Even the screwdriver I had fought so hard for, and felt I had earned, had been taken. I had my horn, my hooves, my single spell, and sats. My brawling skills were, to put it bluntly, pathetic. It would be a miracle if I survived. I had managed miracles before. That was Red Eye's initiate intention. That either I should die, or that I should be forced to kill their slaves. The zebra being only one of many. Compromising the parts of me I held sacred, just so that I might live long enough to kill him. Either way, it would be a victory for him. Although the latter, if I did manage to kill him, would be a purific victory at best. I thought of the image of the mirror. Little Pip as a raider, soaked in blood, dying. That was not my soul. Of that, I was certain. But I knew that I could become that. I was already swimming in the slaughter of my enemies. I realized that I was Monteri Jack, forced between destroying what allowed me to live with myself, or just dying. I needed another option. The heat of the sun pushed down through the black clouds, baking the red-tinged hellscape of Philadelphia. Daff stood firm, snorting heavily. The mangled corpse of Cinderblock oozing blood that soaked into the ground around Daff's hooves. The body of blood, Daff's raider companion, lay not far away. Her own blood dried and caked. Daff looked at her, and I could see hurt in his face. I realized that she was just going to lay there, baking in the heat, until all the fights were over. I wanted to scream. He wasn't even given time to mourn. The next fight had already begun. Daff turned, locking his gay on the zebra, named Zenith. An extremely rare sight in the equestrian wasteland, possibly more so than a pegasus. Zenith's been in the slave pits for years, commented the blue-coated pony, assigned to fight after I did. We worked near each other in the alchemy huts upon the north side for about three months, mostly recycling flamethrower fuel. All that time, she never said a word. The way I heard it, the slaver who captured her cut out her tongue after she said something offensive to them. Number four paused. Her being a zebra and all, it was probably something downright outrageous, like, hello. I watched as the zebra step forward, moving up to Daff and lowering her head and what struck me as a sign of respect for her mortal opponent. Daff didn't see it that way. He saw an opportunity, and he took it. Spinning around, he delivered a brutal buck right into her neck. The zebra fell sprawling. Daff turned, rearing up, lifting both hooves over the fallen zebra. Zenith rolled onto her back and kicked out with her hind hooves, 
planting them ferociously into the rear end of the earth pony's outstretched stomach. Daff fell, clenching his belly, coughing bloody spittle. The zebra somersaulted onto her hooves. Daff grunted and pushed himself back up, only for the zebra to crouch and spin on her one forehoof, her outstretched hind legs sweeping daft legs out from underneath him, and he went down again. I stared, my jaw falling nearly to the floor. I watched the zebra's fluid motions. She wasn't brawling. This was more of a fighting art form. I'd never seen anything like it. Heh. <laughs> Looks like that's the fallen Caesar style. Not that I'm an expert, number four noted with a casual awe. His eyebrows shot up at my blank look. Don't tell me you entered the pit without having read at least a few martial arts of the zebra books. How do you expect to win? N no I stammered. Of all the books I stumbled across into the waste trek, I somehow managed to miss that one. Of, of course not. I turned back to the fight. Daff had gotten back on his hooves and was circling the zebra. The zebra watched him, waiting for his attack with an almost eerie calm. He lunged and he tossed herself down, planting a hoof onto his breast and watching his own momentum being flung over him. Daff hit the dirt, sprawling. She was a far better fighter. This was unfair. But Daff was stronger, and he fought dirtier. Zenith trotted cautiously closer. As suspected, she was looking to end the fight, while the piss-colored buck was still face down in the dirt. Daff trembled, as if in exhaustion and he moaned as he tried to push himself up, only to have his legs go out underneath, his, underneath him. His weakness was a ruse, and the moment Zenith got close enough, Daft twisted around on the ground and kicked a cloud of dirt into her eyes. She whirled, backing up, blinded. Her body sunk into a defensive position, prepared for an immediate attack. But Daft had seen something she apparently hadn't, and instead of turning to fight her, he dashed forward. I heard the beep of an undetonated mine as he galloped over it, kicking the explosive backwards towards the zebra with a hind hoof. Zenith had heard it too. She flung herself away as best she could. The mine exploded in the air, with almost two pony lengths between itself and the zebra. Not lethal, or even crippling, but enough to send her tumbling. The wind knocked out of her. I felt myself gasp. Oh, she can handle a lot more than that, number four commented. The slavers regularly did a number to her back on the huts. Seemed to take great delight in taking everything out on her. Maybe it made it a lot easier for the rest of us. I bristled, wincing both at the mental images of his words conjured and the stinging in my flank. The powder had the, sla the slaver had trapped against my cutie mark was sinking its nasty teeth into my flesh. Hell, I remember one time a unicorn slave messed up the recycling and set herself on fire. The slavers shot her so she didn't run around setting the whole place ablaze. Then, after the flames had gone out, just for fun, they chopped off the unicorn's head and raped the zebra with it. Number four at least had the decency to cringe a little. I was staring in utter horror. Come to think of it, that was just before she volunteered for the pit. Zenith was pulling herself up. Daff had used the moment of reprieve, not to attack, but to run across other pressure plates. The latches on the barrels above clicked free, and the bottom opened, releasing gallons of glowing green slosh. Yep, now that's what most of them have, number four commented. Something large fell out of the glop hitting the ground with a wet thud. Daff was out of the way of all but a few splashes of the goop, but those pulled a scream out of him. He danced, shaking the glop off, and then turned to see his prize. An auto axe lay in the spreading, luminescent green puddle, glistening wetly. Daff grimaced. 
having just a few drops on his flanks. He didn't seem inclined to put something like that into his mouth. Zenith was moving cautiously forward again. She gleaned enough of his tactics to know she wasn't. She didn't wish to engage Daft anymore near the glowing puddle. They began to circle the spill opposite each other, each keeping their distance from the slosh. Zenith, even more so than Daft. The ponies in the bleachers began to stomp in unison. Fight! 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 Daft made a move. He managed to circle around so he was within range of Cinderblock's corpse with Zenith on the other side of the pool. Dashing over Cinderblock's remains, he drew up his hind hooves. Buck! Cinderblock's corpse flew behind him. Sploosh! A wave of green sludge surged against, uh, surged toward Zenith. The zebra pinwheeled to the side in a maneuver I didn't even think possible. She charged towards Daff. The large buck saw coming and crouched down, holding his ground. He drove his hind hooves towards her in a powerful strike the moment she got within hoof's reach. But Zenith jumped. She leapt clean over Daffodil, striking the nape of his neck with a passing hoof. She landed in the graceful roll that ended with her back on her hooves, facing him. Daff seemed frozen in place. He stared, unmoving. Paralyzing hoof! Number four announced. Now that's definitely Fallen Caesar style. She could paralyze a pony with a hoof strike? How the hell was I supposed to fight against her? Daff toppled over. Zenith trotted up to the fallen pony. Her gaze looking into his wide and fearful eyes. The crowd began to chant and pound their hooves. Kill! 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 Stern's voice called out, bizarrely magnified. Finish it! The zebra planted one hoof on Daff's neck. She lowered her head, her muzzle lingering next to his ear a moment, before she bit into his mane. She pulled her head back with a hard jerk. I heard Daff's neck crack. Zenith's teeth let go of the dead pony's mane, and she trotted towards the center of the arena, waiting for her next opponent. Me. The midday heat was becoming stifling under the thick, choking blanket of the Philadelphia cloud cover. My cracked ribs ached. My flank was stinging so badly, I had to wipe tears from my eyes. Zenith stood, watching me with those sad eyes, as I plodded into the arena. Now that I was inside, rather than watching through a gate, I could see more of the pit, but it was mostly just more of the same. There was a third entrance. A set of double doors, behind which I imagined slaver guards were waiting, ready to gallop into whatever had once been an ice skating rink, had the first sign of real trouble. I could see Stern standing on a raised and barricaded platform, above and behind the bleachers. She was wearing her old pre-war headset, which I suspected was responsible for amplifying her voice. She was also wearing her anti-machine rifle, slung over her talon armor. And I could see the mob of ponies staring down into the arena with gleeful anticipation. I noticed a few were eating snacks. I felt a flare of anger. A pony wouldn't want to watch me brutally murdered on an empty stomach, after all. I'm trying to save all of you! Why? I screamed out to them. For just a moment, I could understand how Red Eye morally justified putting these ponies through such suffering to build a better world. I didn't agree, but I could comprehend it. You see, little pony, Mr. Topaz had said, look at what your ponies are doing to each other up there. Look at what you did to each other in here. What makes you think your pathetic, wicked species is worth being anything other than dragon food? I tried to remember my answer. Zena stepped closer to me. I could see that her body bore many scars under her striped coat. Her cutie mark, or whatever zebras have on their flanks, in the place of one, was a squishy jumble of lines, looking more like a complex glyph than a proper cutie mark icon. On her right flank, it looked like some pony had snuffed out cigars against it. 
She lowered her head as she neared me. The same posture which I had taken before as a show of respect. Then very softly, she let only I could hear, the Zenith whispered, I'm sorry. I froze, stunned. The zebra, who hadn't even spoken out when slave masters were raping her with a dead pony's horn, broke her silence for me. A show of respect, indeed. Of course, I realized she was playing the mute, because doing anything else would have resulted in actually losing her tongue. She could break it to me because I was about to die. I also realized, a moment too late, that her words had effectively dropped my guard. Zenith struck me with her four hooves, driving them into my wounded side. I heard and felt as my cracked rib broke and punctured into one of my lungs. I collapsed, sliding backwards from the force of the blow. The world swam as I struggled for air. It was like she'd known just where to strike to cause the most injury, as opposed to Daph, who had just known where to cause the most pain. I looked into the sky. A red fog seeped into the edges of my vision. I saw the griffins flying above, their talons holding rifles. I could hear the pounding of over 200 hooves as the ponies in the bleachers called for my death. A shadow fell over me. I turned to see Zenith rearing up, her hooves raised above me for a fatal blow. I gasped, my horn flaring, and kicked against the ground. My levitation blanket wrapped around me, making me nearly weightless, and I surged up off the ground like a kicked balloon. The zebra's hooves slammed into the dirt and still bore the imprint on my head. Wait! I gasped again, feeling the strain of levitating myself while I was struggling for proper breath. We... we don't have to do this! The zebra looked up at me with an expression of resignation and pity. Please! Don't do what they want you to do. I was sinking back towards the growing... Uh, towards the ground slowly. Zenith watched, waiting for me to come back within reach. Join me! We can escape together! Zenith snorted, giving me a look that made me wonder just how many ponies had made this offer before. But none, I suspected, who could actually succeed. Fight! 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 cried the crowd. I have a plan, I offered, trying to sound more confident than I was. My success rates with plans in the last few days had not been self-inspiring. The entire plot had been amazingly ill-conceived. In truth, I had been arrogant, so prideful in my ability to improvise, so full of myself from past victories, that I actually thought I could walk into the enemy camp with nothing but my wits and win. I let the Elder convince me that this was the only way, because it conveniently allowed me to protect my friends. Instead, I had become a slave, and now I was desperately attempting to float beyond the reach of the zebra's devastating hoof strikes. It was time to get out, regroup, and hopefully come up with a strategy less mind-bogglingly stupid. Zenith jumped, a forehoof striking me in the breast. Pain exploded through my body. I screamed. My magic imploded as I dropped to the ground with a thud. The zebra landed, a pony's length away. Gasping wretchedly for air, I looked up as she took a step backwards bringing her hind hooves into bucking range. My horn glowed again. In desperation, I wrapped the telekinetic field around her throat and began to tighten. As I began to choke her, Zenith bucked at my unbroken ribs. But my choking had thrown her aim just off, and I had learned to dodge. The zebra staggered as I tightened my telekinetic grip. There wasn't much physical force behind my telekinesis, but I had enough to crush her throat. I didn't want to kill the zebra mare, but I had to take her out of the fight. Zenith wobbled, eyes bulging, nostrils flaring. For a moment, she gave me the same terrified look that Daph had given her. Then, that look melted into resignation, and she stopped struggling, watching me with a gaze that told me she had accepted my victory. When she passed out, I released her letting her drop like a sack of apples. 
What an upset! Stern's voice boomed. All around me. The air roared with thunderous applause. Kill! 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 I struggled upright, painfully catching my breath. I looked up at the crowd. I hated them. Every one of them. And trotted over to Zenith's fallen form. She was breathing slowly. I looked up at the barrels. My horn flared again, wrapping one of them in a telekinetic field. But the barrel was securely fastened to the cage ceiling, and my telekinesis was not strong enough to tear it free. Stern seemed to glean that I had something, that I was up to something, because she unslung her anti machine rifle. Finish it! the griffin demanded. Couldn't Stern at least call Zenith her? My mind flashed to the memory of how the barrels opened. I didn't need to pull them down, just flip the latches. Latches were easy. My horn glowed bright. Stern pulled her anti machine rifle forward and peered at me through its scope. Finish it! Now! The latches of the barrel swung open. All of them. My pit bucks click click clicking urgently. True to number four's predictions, most barrels held glowing green sludge and weapons. The barrels released their contents, raining down implements of death. A magical energy lance, a sword, a chainsaw, a chainsaw? and even a couple firearms. I let them fall where the barrels dropped them. It was the sludge I wanted. The luminescent goop was barely translucent. I spun it around and over the inside of the cage, creating a glowing green curtain. Thin as film, but enough to obscure me inside. I didn't want those griffins or guard slavers to be able to take shots at me. Immediately, I gallop to a new prediction. To a new position? And as I predicted, Stern shot a shot at me. Where I had just been standing. I felt tears in my eyes. The pain in my chest was burning. My breathing becoming more ragged as I tried to focus and maintain it in so many places at once. Each breath felt like drowning. I wrapped another te telekinetic sheath around myself cancelling out my weight, then extended it to wrap around the zebra as well. There was never any question that I would be taking her with me. The thought of leaving her behind had never even entered my mind. My vision blurred. I forced myself enough to focus. My horn flared brighter, a layer of overglue, oh, overglow erupting from it. It occurred to me that a keen-eyed griffin might be able to spot the glow of my horn through the certain or through the curtain of muck. But I needed to keep enough focus and channel enough power for just one more trick. All I needed was time. I telekinetically grabbed the magical energy lance and wedged it across the double doors, seconds before the slavers started slamming against them, trying to get in. The curtain weakened, holes appearing along the top of it. One of those tears had almost was almost directly above me, revealing the door in the top of the cage, which I had spotted earlier. Bound closed with a simple lock pick. Or padlock. Fuck. I kicked off, sending myself floating upwards, my eyes fixed on the padlock. I had no bobby pins, and my screwdriver had been stolen from me. I should not need them. Manipulating multiple objects that were out of sight was tricky, but I had pulled pins from grenades hidden in a sack and then new locks. I knew tumblers and internal mechanisms. I should be able to pick a lock with my magic alone. Reaching out with my magic, I enveloped the padlock in a gentle glow. My horn flared as a second layer of overglow burst around the first, streams of light pouring from my head. I felt a bullet lash past me, followed by the sound of a gunshot. Below, the blows against the doors were causing the magical energy lance to bend. I was still floating upwards, carrying the unconscious zebra. We were nearing the cage, but our ascent was slowly alarming. One of the griffins above fired down at me, but the shot sparked off one of the bars of the cage. I can do this, I told myself repeatedly. A second shot sparked against the gate itself, inches from the padlock. Who was I fooling? I could barely breathe. My magic faltered, and the swirling curtain slipped, wavering. 
No. I can do this. I shifted the tumblers into place. The padlock swam open. And my vision swam again. I nearly lost everything. The magical energy lands cracked in two. The doors below swung open, and slavers stumbled into the arena. Frantically, I hovered the padlock away and pushed open the gate. A moment later, we were through, and I was running along the top of the cage as fast as my surviving lung would allow me. I felt everything fall, except my grasp around myself and Zenith. My whole body screamed in pain and exertion. Shots rang out, bullets striking the cage about me, from above and below. I weaved erratically, doing my best to make it hard to become a target. I was reaching the edge of the cage. The ice arena was at the far end of the Philadelphia Fun Farm. With luck, I could jump from it over the fence, again putting a barrier between me and at least the ground bound slavers. The end of the cage came faster than I thought it would, and what I had wanted. I jumped, screaming from the agony in my chest. The two of us soared over the amusement park. My heart sank as I realized I had run the wrong way, and my jump was taking me into the fun farm rather than away from it. A tearing kick jerked my right foreleg with a metallic crunch. The sound of Stern's anti-machine rifle followed closely after searing red agony shot through my leg. The bullet had missed, just barely catching my pit buck, but the force of that alone felt like it was shattering my leg. I fell, a magical field imploding, collapsing into a set of tracks several stories above the amusement park below. I moaned, feeling the world thump rhythmatically through my body as if I was riding a washing machine. Not in the way young fillies do to enjoy themselves. The world seemed crazily tilted. I could only take shallow breaths. Bright pain pulsing in my right foreleg. I heard gunfire. Memory flooded back to me, and my eyes shot open. I looked around, almost falling off the back of the zebra who was carrying me up a slope on the Philadelphia Fun Farms roller coaster track. I'd been out for a few minutes at most, long enough for the zebra to come to. Having woken on the elevated tracks, jumping hadn't been an option. There were only two ways for her to go. I felt thankful that Zenith had returned the favor and taken me with her. My first worry was for my pit buck. I lifted my foreleg, but only managed to raise it a few inches before I let out a tortured scream. Hot pain bursting through my leg. My pit buck had taken an indirect hit. It was not itself damaged, but the bullet had torn through the peripheral. The broadcaster was destroyed, and with it, my plan of escape. I brought up my EFS. My pit buck was flashing alerts. I had taken more rads from being in the middle of all that green sludge than my pit buck liked. My chest and right foreleg had taken crippling wounds, and the latter having suffered a wrenching sprain with a small hairline fracture to the bone. I laid down, or I looked down. I saw slaver ponies shooting at us from the ground. By experience, these mares and bucks were not the best shots, even at close range. If they hit us at a distance, with the cover of the tracks, it would be a sheer dumb luck. Behind us, even more were charging up the tracks. But they were well behind. It was the griffins that were the biggest threat. I looked around but couldn't spot them, which meant little. Zenith reached the apex of the track, stopping just shy of it. A set of three colorful painted pony-shaped carriages sat on top of the roller coaster's hills, rusting for 200 years. There wasn't any room to go around them, leaving the zebra no apparent choice but to climb over them. She cautiously put a hoof onto the carriage, of the rear one and pressed her weight down on it. The carriage gave a metallic groan. She looked back at me with a grimace that I wasn't able to match. I focused, wrapping us in a levitation field to reduce our weight. Perspiration broke out across my head. Hot coals formed in my lungs, only one of which could breathe. The, effect, the effort sucked all the remaining strength out of me, and my magical field popped as I nearly blacked out again. No. Damn it. Why was this happening now? 
I had overtaxed my magic once before. It had taken days, and a magical statuette, before I had properly floated objects again. This felt much the same. Perhaps not a true burnout, but a severe drop in power. The result of having pushed so hard in such a weakened state. A true burnout could be imminent. I steadied my breath and focused again. The horn glowed softly. The levitation field wrapped slowly around us. I was breathing quickly, nearly hyperventilating. But the field was holding. Climb, I gasped. Now! The zebra cautiously mounted the carriage, then stepped down into the bench of the first seat. The old car rocked slightly, groaning again. Step by step, she started walking across the trio of carriages. We were halfway across when the purple middle carriage, when a hole punctured through the nose of the carriage in front, followed by a distant report. I grunted as Zena took an involuntary step backwards and fell partially into the carriage seat. My magic imploded, and the linked carriages let out a protesting whine. I had been wrong. It wasn't the griffins I had to worry about. It was the snipers in the damn picky pie balloons. Once we crested the top, we had put ourselves in their crosshairs, and the carriages slowed us to a crawl, giving them easy shots. Another shot put clean through the seat in the carriage frame behind us. Zenith dumped me off her back into the cover of the seat well, and then scrambled to take cover in the seat well ahead of us. We were pinned. The shadow of a griffin shot over us, dropping something that hit the rim of the stairwell and bounced over the track. A moment later, the grenade went off, the sound of splintering wood accenting the explosion. I felt a subtle and unpleasant shift in the carriages beneath us. The grenade had taken out some of the beams in the already precarious roller coaster's framework. Another griffin soared past us, spreading his wings and banking. With alarm, I saw the creature was holding a rocket launcher. There was no time to think. We had to go. Jumping out of the seat well, I swung around and bucked the, <clears throat> the link that held the two front carriages to the back one. Another gunshot ripped the air above my left flank and punched into the back carriage. I noticed belatedly that the nose of each carriage was shaped and painted to look comically like the faces of Pinkie Pie's friends. I flung my forehooves back into the seat, well, and bucked Applejack in the face. My body screamed in protest. My right foreleg flared in pain and slipped. The orange carriage squealed and began sliding backwards down the tracks. Sparks sprang from rust-jammed wheels. The slaver's ponies charging after us stopped abruptly, standing like pins before a bowling ball, then turned and tried to run the other way. One of them tried to leap over the lower set of tracks and disappeared from sight. Without the uh, rearmost carriage as an anchor, the front two began to slowly slide down the frontward slope. I swung myself, trying to hook my injured leg back around the seat wall's edge. I succeeded but the pain slammed into my head like a sledgehammer. I screamed, nearly slipping free entirely. Zenith jumped back into my sweet well, grabbing her, my mane in her teeth. The rocket launcher griffin fired. A streak of smoke shot toward us, tipped with violent death. Zenith wrenched me into the carriage, pushing us both down as far as we would go. A moment later, the rocket struck into the track almost where the rear car had been. The explosion washed over the top of us, cutting our backs with shrapnel and kissing us with flame. The carriage lurched forward hard, bucking up from the track and slumming down on the bits of metal track and clunks of burning wood into the park below. We had been a slow crawl forward, abruptly transformed into a racing plummet. The carriages bumped and rattled, squealing all the way down. The light blue carriage ahead of us bucked and skipped, threatening to jump the tracks. If it did, we were done for. There was no calamity to catch me this time. My stomach lurched violently as the downhill slide <clears throat> swept into an uphill thrust, tossing us against the seat well's bench. The upward angle of the carriage now left our seats well exposed. 
A bullet punctured through the bench, inches from Zenith's left shoulder, spraying rotted foam. One of the griffins, I believe the one who had tossed the grenade, had unslung his lever-action rifle and was flying towards us, slowly pumping shots in our direction. Our impromptu ride had put distance between us and them, but we were already slowing. He would be in optimal firing range in a few moments. The second griffin was reloading his rocket launcher. A third swept from around, around from behind and banked, moving out of my line of sight beneath the wooden hills of the roller coaster. The lever action griffin fired again, and a line of blood spurted from the back of Zenith's neck. A grazing shot that I knew must burn, but she gritted her teeth and kept silent. The griffin moved closer, aiming, and fired again. The rifle was empty. Cursing, the griffin threw it. I drew up into a hover and began to reload. Reloading meant we had less he had less of a grip on his weapon. I focused and telekinetically wrenched the firearm away, closing it. The griffin's eyes widened as his own weapon twirled around and pointed at him. Blam! As he fell, another stream of smoke leapt up from the griffin's missile launcher and raced towards us. The missile streaked past us, and I heard it detonate somewhere ahead. I urgently floated the lever action rifle checking the shots. The Griffin had only loaded two shots into the rifle before I had snatched it away, leaving me with one shot. I had to choose my next shot. The third Griffin suddenly swooped up right next to our carriage as we crested the smaller hill, aiming a scatter gun point blank at our faces. Blam! The Griffin spiraled downwards, my barely aimed shot having gone through her wing. Zenith was cringing in the seat, well. I dared to sit up and look ahead. At the base of the hill, the track took a sharp curve and shot into the tunnel that passed through the barn-like Ministry of Morale building. But the second rocket launcher had torn a hole in the track. Zenith muttered something in a strange tongue, appearing at my side. Then, in a low voice, I hope this is still going according to plan. Yes, I lied. I crawled forward, cringing as a balloonist sniper sent another shot into the track ahead of us. The bullet was from the anti-machine rifle, obliterating the track. I hooked my flanks against the forward seat and slid over the face of Twilight Sparkle. A small horn protruding from the front gave me something to brace my shoulder against. Reaching down from my left forehoof, I kicked at the latch, freeing the light blue car that was in front of us. Free of extra weight, the front car began to separate, slipping ahead. It hit the turn, then the gap, and the Rainbow Dash carriage did what it really wanted to do. It flew from the tracks and caught air. Focusing for all I was worth, I enveloped the Twilight Sparkle car in magical energy, negating our weight. I prayed to Luna that it would be enough to let us jump the gap. I prayed to Celestia that my strength wouldn't give out until we had. If there was any doubt in my mind that the goddesses were watching from above, it evaporated when both prayers were answered. The purple twilight sparkle carriage swept into the darkness of the tunnel. A hard jolt slammed against us as our out-of-control ride finally skipped the track. I felt my body being flung from the car as I skidded and flipped. I hit the track roughly. New pain bit deeply into my shoulder and arced like electricity along the nerves of my left foreleg as my left shoulder struck the metal rail. Zenith remained uh, huddled in the seat as the carriage rolled once before crashing against a low row of clown pony-shaped pylons. I looked up, wheezing. I could see the zebra's form crawl shakily out of the wreckage. I struggled to my hooves. Both my forelegs protested with discoherent pain. My head swam. I wondered if I was in shock. Zenith trotted up to me. So, my little pony savior, she said in a low, exotic voice. This is all part of the plan, yes? I turned on my pit box lamp. Somewhere in here, there has to be a way into the building. The plan is to break into Red Eye's home? I could hear the 
credulously lurking behind her almost innocent tone. I nodded. We make it to the roof. There's always a Pinkie Pie balloon anchored up there. We're going to take it. And that's how we get past the moat in the wall. I winced as I fought for breath. I have friends waiting outside for us. The Libra stared at me appraisingly. Are your friends as crazy as you? You don't have to follow me, I noted with a sigh. I had saved the zebra's life, but in doing so, I had kidnapped her. She couldn't go back to the slavers. We both knew that. Until she was past the wall, I had pretty much trapped her with me. And after that, however... Although, I really wish you would. You saved my life, little pony, she answered. You are responsible for it now. It is up to you to get me to safety. Until then, I follow. I nodded. And after? You are responsible, still, she said firmly, unless I take that responsibility from you. I blinked. It was one thing to be thinking such thoughts. It was quite another to have them thrown back at me in some sort of insane zebra logic. We trekked further into the tunnel, looking for a door into the old Ministry of Morale hub that Red Eye and Stern had made the center of their slave empire. I was badly, badly hurt, but in my experience, I had much easier time turning interiors to my advantage in a fight. I was feeling a touch of confidence returning. The griffin with the missile launcher flew into the tunnel behind us. Both Zenith and I shrunk into the darkness around, partial cover, and held still. The griffin began to walk along the track, his eyes adjusting to the darkness. I focused on the latch where his saddlebags, where he was keeping the extra missiles. Nothing happened. I focused again, harder. Nothing. Not even a faint glow from my horn, much less a telekinetic field. I hung my head. Burnout. That saving jump from the gap had taken what little I had left. I was defenseless. And useless. Damn it. Why did this have to happen now? I had always counted on my levitation to get at least to get us at least to the balloon. Now, we'd have to find another way to get into it. If there was another way. And if we survived to the roof. Which is now more than a doubt. I looked back in time to see the shadow move near Griffin. Zenith had slipped right up next to him, completely unnoticed. Only now did I spot her as she snuck out and struck her and struck him with a hoof. The griffin made a choking sound as his body went rigid. She wasted no time snapping his neck with her forehooves. I looked over the griffin as he fell dead beside the zebra. I wished he had been carrying a rifle. I didn't contemplate taking the missile launcher, but then, not being steel hooves, I decided against it. Clearly, Zenith preferred a stealthy approach to combat, similar to my own. Plus, with my lack of experience, teeth-wielding high explosives inside a building seemed like a very bad idea. I also wished his armor was more pony-shaped. I did, however, empty his saddlebags and take them for myself. I peered around the corner, staring down at a decaying pink hallway. Two ponies wearing armor in red eyes colors were standing guard near a wall terminal, watching over a shallow alcove, opposing them. I thought I saw the glow of Sunrise Sarsaparilla machine coming out of it. These guards were naturally hunting us, but as best as I could tell, there was no way around them. The only other way had collapsed decades ago. Still, I felt a pang at the idea of attacking ponies who weren't even threatening us, slavers or not. This stretched the definition of self-defense. I wondered if I would be, it would be possible to sneak past them, but the hallway was far too narrow, and they were standing with their tails to the wall. We had to pass directly in front of them, and no matter how light-hooped we were, crouching didn't make us invisible. Zena slipped past me before I could motion her. She had no moral hesitation about killing random members of Red Eye's forces. To my surprise, she managed to creep halfway down the hall before they spotted her. She crossed the remaining distance with a leap, landing on her forehooves and bucking one of the guards in the head 
hard enough to send his helmet clantering down the hallway. The other guard was a unicorn, and she was already floating the automatic rifle towards the zebra. I screamed out in the pain in my legs as I charged the guard, lowering my horn. The unicorn turned, surprised by the second attacker, giving Zenith a chance to kick the automatic rifle. The magical field around it imploded as the weapon flew out of it and bounced against a dingy pink wall. My horn glanced off the guard's armor, hurting me more than her. Her horn was glowing. Electricity burst around her, tearing at my nerves as I stumbled and fell to the floor. Between the guard's legs, I could see Zenith collapse as well. I groaned, remembering that, unlike me, other unicorns have more magic than mere telekinesis under their hats. The unicorn wrapped her automatic rifle in a new sheath of magic and floated it over to me, apparently considering the unicorn attacker to be the most dangerous threat. Fatal mistake. The automatic rifle went off, peppering the ground next to me as bullets with bullets as Zenith swept the unicorn's legs up from under her. I was barely able to move, but the zebra seemed to have recovered most of her faculties. My striped companion rolled into the guard and struck her repeatedly in the face with her forehooves. I cringed at the sound of the unicorn's horn shattering. The magic around her rifle evaporated, and the firearm fell to the ground within biting distance. By the time I'd gotten up, rifle in mouth, Zenith had rendered both guards deceased. I looked around. True to my suspicions, the alcove across the guards held a couple of vending machines, a Sunset Spasparilla machine, and a functional-looking iron shot ammo emporium. Between them was a heavy metal door of a vault. What is this? Zenith asked, staring into the room that had been sealed behind the vault door. She had been understandably perturbed when I stopped to hack the terminal, but relented when I explained that I needed to catch my breath. A statement, my shallow, harsh breaths, had proven altogether true. The worst part of my injuries was the fact that I couldn't risk healing them. Now with my broken rib and punctured lung, any poultice would cause those to heal wrong. I needed velvet remedy before I could dare use anything more than a healing bandage. And, in our situation, I didn't even dare use painkillers. I needed to be thinking straight. The wasteland, taunting me. I answered, as I stepped into the vault, looking around at the most empty shelves with their scattered memory orbs. None of which I could use until I got my magic. But the line of passkey coated wall safes along the back, none of which I could open. The equestrian wasteland loved rubbing my face in every moment of weakness. What are they? She questioned, looking at a dozen of the orbs littering the floor. Confessions. I started collecting the orbs, picking them up in my teeth and dropping them into my pilfered saddlebags opposite the ammo and sas Sunset Sarsaparilla. Moving through the shelves, I spotted the glowing of another terminal. Perhaps there was a way to open the safes after all. Reaching it, I hooked my pit buck into the terminal and began to hack. The terminal was exceptionally tough. The little pony in my head started crying out for mintals after the third time I was forced to back out of the system before its security protocols could lock it up. I fought to silence that voice. I was increasingly aware of how long this was taking. Stern had ponies scouring the building and surrounding grounds for us. They were spread out, but eventually one or more of them would stumble across us. One more try, I insisted to Zenith, after I backed out for a fourth time. If I can't get it, we'll go. Why are you trying to unlock Red Eye's safes for, anyway? What do you hope to find? Zenith asked reasonably. Balloon tickets, perhaps? I snorted. I was about to reply, probably with something snide, when I found the password. Sir Lincelot. After staring at that for a moment, I longer felt bad for not figuring it out sooner. From the timestamp of the terminal, it had become clear that no pony else had figured that out either. 
The terminal had not been used to access these safes for more than 200 years. A security notice indicated that the far left safe had been accessed several times in the last years prior by the use of a passkey. I opened them all. The far right safe held a badly damaged memory orb case with a single orb inside. The other three were gone. There were also an audio log, a dingy cloak, a stealth bug, and a half dozen fly files. I caught Zenith's reaction as I pulled out the cloak, even though she recovered quickly. What? I asked. Nothing, she lied. I took the audio recording and memory orb, keeping them separate from the mess of orbs I had collected from the floor. I offered Zenith a cloak. This dingy color would provide better camouflage than her stark stripes, and it was too large for me. She nodded and put it on, but it slipped off. The neck collapse was broken. I opened the second safe and jumped back in alarm at the pulsing, swirling lights that poured out. Inside were four egg-shaped objects that glowed with a high uh, hypnotic dance of dark colors. Wh what? Zenith trotted closer, studying the objects without looking directly into them. Balefire eggs. I stared dumbly for a moment, and my brain deciphered this. That's right. Fluttershy didn't actually design city-destroying spells. She designed the magical framework that would take a normal spell and augment it beyond, well, beyond anything they really imagined. But like the healing spells, there had been magic to be amplified. These balefire eggs were the base magic for the massive murdering balefire bombs. How big an explosion? I asked my zebra companion. I don't know. I was never alive 200 years ago, fighting the war, when these were used. Touché. I imagined the Ministry of Morale confiscating these on a raid of some sort. I could see why these would be locked up. The third safe held what looked like a Pegasus Enclave helmet, with a built-in recollector, complete with a black opal. It also held a lot of paperwork labeled CZA, including many photographs too warped by age to make out. I yanked the paperwork out, scattering it onto the floor as I tried to get something that was hidden underneath it. Citizen Zebra Activities, Zenith said behind me reading one of the folders I had knocked from the safe. Your government was paying close attention to every zebra living in Equestria. Not my government, I corrected swiftly, and Minister Morale was watching every pony. Behind the papers was what looked like a first-generation pit buck. The pit buck was closed, and there were some ancient bloodstains in the felt lining. It had been removed through amputation, Hopefully, post-mortem. I quickly the, plugged the pit buck into my own and started looking through the files, but they were encrypted with the odd dual encryption which I had discovered my first night into the stable 2. The only thing I could get from it was an auto-mapped floor of stable 3. The stable looked identical to stable 2, except the apple orchard was only two-thirds the size and there were interlocking Overmare offices. I shuddered inexplicably. The final safe was the one Red Eye had been using, and it held a big prize. The schematics for the radiation-powered engine. Zenith took an involuntary step back and whipped the poster at the top of the stairwell. Doom Bunny! She whispered, enigmatically. I stared from my zebra companion to the poster and back. It was the same poster I had seen in the clinic, only this time in better repair. Fluttershy, surrounded by animals, with the words, Remember, we are all in this together. Care for one another. At first, I thought Zenith was returning to Fluttershy. It almost made sense. I could see Fluttershy being regarded as the bringer of doom and destruction considering her connection to the mega spells, and she was abundantly cute. 
Then my eyes caught the little white rabbit sitting on her head. My eyebrows went up, and I turned to Zenith in disbelief. Doom Bunny? Seriously? Zenith snorted. You would not understand. You have not heard the tales of Fluttershy's protector. My ears were tilting, and I knew I was giving her the most astoundingly dubious look. Doom Bunny was a horror on the battlefield. Fluttershy came to heal, even the zebra soldiers, and her protection annihilated anyone foolish enough to try and attack her. The bunny? Oh, Doom Bunny was more than just a rabbit. Doom Bunny was death with sharp pointy teeth. She was messing with me. She had to be messing with me. More powerful than a creature several times its size, thanks to the chemicals the Doom Bunny brewed in secret laboratories. Chemicals? This was insane. Zenith lowered her face to mine, speaking in an odd accent. Oh yes, Doom Bunny was a master in the laboratory. I also hear it can cook and toss a mean salad. She smiled a little. She was messing with me. Although, from the look in her eyes, not entirely. We moved on, finding ourselves all too inappropriate, all too appropriately at what seemed like the research laboratory's floor. Beyond the stairwell was a single door with a small window set into it. Through the window we could see a sprawling place dedicated to arcane and earth pony sciences. A huge picture window on the far end of the room glowed with the deepening red tint light of Philadelphia. The day was ending. The sun would soon set. We slipped through the door silently. The one pony trotting around inside had not noticed our entry, and Zenith made quick work of him. I put down the automatic rifle and started tugging off his lab coat. Zenith raised an eyebrow, and I, as I shucked it on. It's not much protection, I admitted, but anything is better than nothing. I would have taken the armor from Red Eye's guards, but after nearly being killed by a Pegasus, I wasn't going to make that mistake again. Besides, it makes me feel more... sciency. Zenith rolled her eyes, then trotted towards the apothecary cabinets in the, tr in the trotting closet, towards the back of the room. She put a hoof through the lock in the first one and pulled it open. I pulled out the audio recording, downloading it into my pit buck, intending to play it when we gave the room a look over. My eyes fell to the schematics for Party 10 Mintals. This research lab certainly would have everything I needed to make some, and I felt increasingly desperate. It took a severe force of will to scroll away from the recipe and force myself to think of Calamity. Velvet Remedy. Homage. I remembered Homage's sweet voice, and something she said floated back to me. Oh, a mixture of rage and painkillers. A friend of mine, a friend and I found the recipe in the ruins of a MOP clinic when we were younger. I blinked, then called out to Zenith. Wait, you mean to tell me that Fluttershy's pet rabbit invented Stampede? Hello? Rary's voice asked in my ear bloom as I started looking through the terminals and notes that filled the lab. It swiftly became clear that I was getting only one side of the conversation. Oh, hello, your majesty. How delightful for you to call. Oh, same as always. So much to do, so many projects, and so little time. Honestly, half the time I feel the same about running a ministry as Fluttershy felt about being a model. But the other half, I absolutely love it. Of course, I still find the time to create new dresses. And to get my beauty sleep. I think I'd go insane if I didn't... Oh, no, no, no. I have few missed meals never hurt any pony. And it helped me keep my figure. Yes, yes, I did hear what happened to Sakura. And I'm as enraged as any pony. I've already promised Pinkie Pie any resources my ministry has to hers in an effort to help hunt down the brutes responsible and bring them to justice. On the plus side, you have to admit 
The new poster line is really effective. Rarity sounded legitimately upset about Zakora, and only thinly pleased about the effectiveness of her propaganda. The name was familiar. Oh yes, the zebra who was Applejack's friend, possibly a friend of all of them. I can see why Rarity would draw the connection. Pinkie Pie? She's always eccentric, darling. No, not any more than usual. No, Princess Luna, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Strange and Pinkie Pie go hoof and hoof. You just learn to accept that about her, and love her all the more for it. I recalled how Twilight Sparkle, in the Vinyl Scratch Orb, had commented on everyone covering for Pinkie Pie and her addiction. I was immediately thankful that I'd resisted the urge to make more party time mentals. I will admit, however, that I'm getting a bit worried about a few of my other friends. Well, I've heard a rumor, just a rumor, mind you, that Applejack is having some trouble within her own ministry. No, I really couldn't say. And Twilight, have you seen her recently? She's just exhausted and terribly stressed out. The poor dear has taken on so much responsibility and so much work. Well, you do have to admit, other than me, of course, Twilight Sparkle is the only one who has really tried to run her ministry, other than just tossing ideas at them like horseshoes. And the less said about Rainbow Dash's ministry, the better. And with the big moves underway, and Spike starting to uh, his dragonic adolescence, so you just know he's a real saddle fool right now. No, no. But Princess Luna, I really think Twilight Sparkle needs a vacation. No, everybody else is fine. At least, they were last time I saw them. Fluttershy is doing brilliant. I see her every week. I do wish I could see the other others more often. They were my first real friends. My only ones, to be honest. And I miss them all terribly. But there's just always too much to do. I can't remember the last time we were all together. Oh wait, I can. It was Pinkie Pie's birthday party. No, not this year. Last year, I think? Or was it the year before? For the first time in the conversation, Rarity's voice faltered. I could feel the sadness she was trying to hide. It resonated deeply. Maybe because my heart held similar ache. Oh no, it's fine. It's just, sometimes I feel like we're pulling apart. And I can't stand to see what that happened. I really must do something about it. I needed my friends. I was trembling, more from just, like, more than from just pain, as the hour recording drew to a close. No, Princess Luna, the pleasure was all mine. Thank you for calling. I read the entries that had been concealed within the terminal on the lead researcher's desk, a desk which held an ashtray, a box of cigars, and nearly two dozen bottle caps. Bypass spells. According to the research I was seeing, the Ministry of Arcane Sciences had cracked it already, about a month before the end of the world. They had begun limited use, but for weapons to create shield screens that would allow you to only that would allow only specific materials to pass through. Red Eye's research in here had been twofold. First, the scientists have been working to develop or to apply a bypass of some sort of weapon effect. The full details have been uh, reducted after the research had been successful. From what little I could read, that was less than a week before I arrived, I was willing to extend the Steel Ranger's Elder the benefit of the doubt and assume she didn't know. The second line of research was ongoing and met with considerably less promising results. Rider was trying to figure out how to trick a bypass into ignoring something that wasn't designed to ignore. Zenith was filling a bag full of herbs and chemicals from the supply, supply closet and was trotting back towards me when something outside the window made her freeze in her tracks. I abandoned the terminal and moved to her side as quickly as my legs would allow. I stared out the window as something huge came out from the red glow of the Philadelphia crater. It was an armored black olicorn, easily three times the size of a normal one. The air was rippling with power. 
She flew towards us, leaving swaths of energy in her wake. What? What? What is this? I couldn't speak further. My mouth had gone dry. She's been basking in the radiation of the Philadelphia crater, Zenith commented, then explained as if to a child. So creatures of radiation do not merely heal in its presence. If they absorb enough of it, they grow stronger, more powerful. Olicorns could become massive behemoth super olicorns? I squeaked in impotent rage. Th that's not fair! I looked up towards the sky, cursing Celestia and Luna in turn. Wasn't it enough that they were magically far more adept than I? That they were smart, crafty, fucking telepathic, with shields that only a small number of things could actually get through, and they could fly, and go invisible, or teleport? I found enough voice to rasp at the heavens. What do you want from me? In your names, what the fuck do you want? A field of dark blue light wrapped around the enormous window, and the glass began to vibrate. In a sudden image of the abator that I had turned the maze of mirrors into. Run, I whispered to Zenith. We turned and fled. As we dived through the door to the stairwell, I heard the window shatter. And I heard none of the shards hit the ground. I spun and shoved the door closed behind us. An eye blinked before the super olicorn sent hundreds of lethal shards of glass into the door. When the barrage ended, I lifted myself up and dared a peek through the little window in the door. I watched as a huge black olicorn swept into the room and activated her shield. A bubble of force expanding around her with enough power to tear into the floor and ceiling, blasting apart desks and chemistry sets. The energy sloughing off the bubble caused nearby terminals to explode in sprays of sparks. And I saw the automatic rifle which had left behind fall through the broken floor into the level below. Well, at least I didn't have to worry about destroying the research. I turned away, terrified, and discovered that I could make myself gallop far faster than my body wanted me to let me. It hurt. My chest raged as if I was breathing liquid fire, but I ran. The alicorn blasted up through the floor into the hallway. Her size was too big to comfortably move through the, surf, uh, through the space, but it hardly mattered. Her shield just ripped away the walls as she passed near them, chewing up parts of the offices on either side. The thought flashed through my mind that she just might bring the whole building down upon us. Her horn blazed with an almost black light. Her shield dropped briefly as she lashed out with dark energies that only crudely resembled black lightning. I tore around a corner, my body feeling like it was about to explode, and then explode again. Zenith was in front of me, moving far more gracefully. The hallway behind us was shredded with the smell of ozone and black licorice. I followed her up another flight of stairs, screaming out in agony, and hating the building for making us climb when the damn monster behind us didn't have to. The super alicorn tore through the ceiling, hovering in front of us as it made it to the top. I stumbled and crashed to a stop, realizing with utter loathing that we would have to go back down. Only my body didn't want me to move anymore. My body wanted to just give up and die. I felt Zenith bite into my mane and toss me onto her back. The giant black olicorn spread her wings and pointed her horn. A point of light flickered in the front of her shield, then spiraled to create an opening. I realized with a dismay and amazement that even if I had my magic, it would be useless. This olicorn shield was so powerful that she couldn't cast a spell through it. Zenith went down, dropping me in a sack of pain. I saw her twitching. Heart attack spell. She would be permanently damaged or dead within seconds. I screamed. As a super alicorn for being so ridiculously powerful and evil and totally unfair, at the goddesses for allowing such a nightmare to exist, and for making me face it, and just after I'd lost my magic too. 
at the Philadelphia Crater for being so damn radioactive. With a rage-fueled strength beyond what I could actually muster, I wrenched my suffering body off the floor and galloped at the creature, which I suddenly realized looked an awful lot like the old pictures of Nightmare Moon. I leapt, jumping partway into the opening of the Super Alicorn Shield. The edge cut deeply into my chest, like I was hanging on a curved razor blade. I struggled, cutting myself even worse. My blood poured down both the side, the inside and outside of the shield. The Alicorn at least had the grace to look shocked. I had succeeded, causing her to drop the spell attacking Xena's heart. I couldn't get inside with her, but with a mortally wounded cry, I tossed my head back, pulling up one of my saddlebags and dumping the contents inside of her shield. Dozens of memory orbs scattered among the bottom of the magical bubble. The Olochron glanced at them and was unimpressed. She turned her attention to me. In a panic, I realized what was about to happen and kicked myself away before the hole in the shield synthesized closed. If I had been any slower, the Super Alicorn Shield would have cut me in half. I collapsed, bleeding heavily onto the floor. That was it. I was done. Time to sleep now. But as I passed out, there was a, smi a slight smile on my face. Despite all the pain, I had saved Zenith. And I had proved that you could trick one of those fucking cunts the same way twice. The last thing I saw before darkness overwhelmed me was the alicorn floating in her impervious bubble, cut off by every danger, except for a few dozen memory orbs and four balefire eggs. I never heard the explosion, but Zenith told me later that it was loud, only louder. When I awoke, we were in a Buck's bathroom. I was propped up in a stall, looking out at a poster of Pinkie Pie. Watching you piss forever? It didn't, I didn't hurt anywhere near as much as I should, assuming I wasn't simply dead. And really, who would put a Pinkie Pie poster in a bathroom in heaven, for that matter? Or for that matter, in a bathroom anyway? Which worried me considerably. I felt lightheaded and odd. I looked down. I was wrapped in healing bandages, probably three or four medical kits worth. There were more on the floor next to me, blood drenched and spent. I had been in here for some time. My mind grudgingly realized that I was doped up on painkillers. This escape plan was going well. Zenith trotted back into view. You our insane pony. Thank you. I wish I could let you rest some more, but we must go. We are being hunted. I nodded and tried to get up. My limbs didn't want to cooperate, and a moment later, I once again found myself riding the zebra, slung over her back like an old carpet. I blushed with embarrassment and hoped I wasn't bleeding all over her. I wondered what riding like this would do to the wounds on my breast and how well the magical bandages had healed my other injuries. My left shoulder no longer hurt, and my right leg felt only mildly sprained. Zenith picked up my saddlebags with her teeth, and then added them across her flanks, along with her sack of apothecary supplies. I helped tie it to her securely. My sharp companion crept through the floors swiftly, yet cautiously, clearly trying to keep ahead of something. I knew we weren't that we were being hunted by stern slavers, but something about this felt different. My thoughts turned dark. After the Super Alicorn, I wasn't ready for another surprise. What's after us? I asked, dreading the answer. Winter, Zenith whispered in an ominous tone. My painkiller fogged mind thought to make sense of that. It's summer. I responded blandly. The zebra snorted. Red eyes sober dog, winter, is tracking our scent. Mind replayed the part of the broadcast from Red Eye that I had found particularly striking. 
I was lucky, fortunate beyond my deserving, to be blessed with a safe places to roam, security from the fiends and horrors of the Equestrian Wasteland, and companionship in the form of a beloved dog, Winter. Oh, the adventures we had. If he was a cult at that time, the dog should have passed away naturally from old age. But now I imagine that instead of letting that happen, he'd cybernetically enhanced it, replacing part after part as each failed. It was a macabre? I don't know. I groaned. I really, really needed to get out of Philadelphia. I made it up two flights of stairs without trouble. Three times, Zenith managed to creep past slavers unnoticed, even with me on her back. As we passed an open office, I could see the overhanging of eaves out the window. Shadows in the light of a setting sun that turned the world outside a color of bloody river. We were almost to the roof. I heard a low, tinny growl. I looked back. Behind us, I saw a half-robotic dog stalking towards us. Winter was more machine than animal. His brain was encased in a lightly glowing tank, which looked so shockingly like that of a brain bot that I began to assume it wasn't ponies, but pet dogs whose brains were used in those awful things. Winter's forepaws ended in claws that looked like they were made from claw tips of hellhounds. Even Zenith didn't want to fight that thing. The zebra bolted, galloping as fast as she could. Winter howled and gave chase, the glow of his brain case shifting to crimson. I wished I had the automatic rifle, or for that matter, any weapon at all. Somehow, I didn't think I could strike it down with balefire looks. We made it to the stairwell marked roof access, and the cyber dog nipping as Zenith soothes. I realized belatedly that the dog could have jumped and started tearing me apart, but chose not to. We were being corralled. I turned toward Zenith. Before I could, we burst onto the roof. Zenith skidded to a stop, trapped between the Ministry of Morale roof and the cloudy, blood-red sky. The anchored Pinkie Pie balloon was still there, but there were two others, with a third closing in. Half a dozen anti-machine rifles were trained in our direction. With a clear note of sarcasm, Zenith added, Still according to plan, right? Winter came out behind us and stopped as if guarding the door back. I closed my eyes, waiting for the shot, but the sniper ponies were hesitating, waiting for something. The growl behind us gave Zenith a clue. Red Eye's coming. So, the bastard was going to take care of us himself. Fuck that. Oh, come on! I yelled up at the giant, inflated Pinkie Pie heads. Just do it already! I was exhausted. The painkillers were wearing off, and the pain was beginning to flood back in. A pillar of golden flame, tinged with balefire green, shot out of the Philadelphia crater. The bolt of light reached its apex and spread out wings that flared across the sky like a second sun. Pyrelite dipped and swooped towards us, burning with an aura of emerald and gold nearly a hundred times her size. The creatures of radiation do not merely heal in its presence. If they absorb enough, they grow stronger and more powerful. Sorry, Celestia, Luna. For everything bad, I thought. The incoming Pinkie Pie balloon erupted in flame at Pyrelite's passing. Her majestic harbinger opened her beak, <clears throat> opened her beak, and bright green balefire blasted out, tearing across the roof at us and above us. All three of the Pinkie Pie balloons ignited, becoming inferno. Bits of burning balloon and slaver flesh rained down on us as the blazing zeppelins began to collapse striking towards the amusement park below. I hoped hastily that it wasn't full of slaves and that 
the burning rem remnants of the balloons would hit the slavers surrounding the building. Pyrelight! I cheered, clapping my hooves in applause. Xena stared upwards, having lost the very notion of speech. The cyberdog panicked and fled down the stairs. Pyrelight swooped around. I could see the energy she had absorbed was already bleeding off her. Like the scintillating waves that came off the black alicorn. The bird dived, and I thought I could hear the crackles of fire and the sound of slaver screams below. I was so overjoyed at the turn of events that it took me several minutes to realize the pyre light had incinerated what I hoped to be our ride. We were still trapped in Philadelphia. Our capture was as deserving as it was inevitable. I found myself staring through a haze of red, not a fault of my own vision, but a property of the room we had been marched into. The air was filled with some sort of odd steam. My already strained lungs pitched a fit as I attempted to breathe it. Red lamps lined the room. Diffusing their light, they made the air take a sickening scarlet tint. There was a line on the floor that the well-armed griffin besides us had warned us not to cross. Winter crouched nearby, ready to launch himself at the, fir at the first to run. With Xena's skills, I thought to myself, it might be possible to fight our way out of the situation, but the very idea made me want to drop from weariness. Red-Eye trotted through the door on the opposite wall, next to a large, dark screen. He raised a hoof, and the griffins flanking us took their leave. I heard them lock the lock and bar the door behind us. Little Pip, he said generously. Sit. Relax. I mean you no harm. Obviously, the same couldn't be said for us. I was still processing the mere notion that Red Eye would lock himself in a room with us when Zenith charged at him. Murder in his eyes. Her eyes. She slammed against an invisible wall, hard enough that she was lucky she didn't break her neck. I stared around, and realized suddenly the reason for the odd atmosphere. You're using the reddened mist to conceal an alicorn shield, I surmised aloud. I was actually slightly impressed. You must have at least two green ones doing their statue thing just behind the walls. Red Eye beamed to me. Literally, in the mist, the line of red light shooting from his cybernetic eye was clearly visible. I wanted us to be able to talk freely, without any pony attacking any pony else. He shot a weary look at the recovering zebra. What do you want? I asked dourly. There was only one reason I could think for him to spare us, and I didn't like it. All I want is for you to do something that we were going to do anyways. What I said, in a tone both casual and infuriatingly confident. I just wanted you to do it on my time scale. Great. My mortal enemy had a quest for me. My life sucked. I want you to kill the goddess. My jaw hit the floor. Okay. I did not see that coming. B but you serve the goddess. You're... You're her... High fucking priest! Red Eye scowled slightly, sitting back. I like to think of us more like partners. And sadly, the partnership is no longer beneficial to my goals. He looked over, ignoring Zenith completely. And, after your handling of the creator unicorn, Alicorn, I really do think that you have what it takes to succeed. Do tell. I glared. As I'm sure you have noticed, the goddess controls her children, telepathically. They are not so much individuals, as they are extensions of her will, and they will remain so until she is finally put to rest. I nodded, solemnly. There is no point in working towards the freedom of all ponies if unity comes with chains. Red-Eye pontificated. 
There is no room in New Equestria for slave masters, and no room for slaves. Zenith nickered. Not much room for you, then. I smiled, my own sentiment echoing hers. Red Eye regarded us calmly. No. No, there's not. Okay. Second time, he caught me by surprise. What do you intend to do, then? Intend to do, then? Kill yourself? He laughed. Red Eye had a charismatic, likable laugh. I hated him for that. No, no. I plan to ascend. Why don't you take care of the goddess? It will finally be time for me to join Unity, myself. But, not as one of the rest of you. Someone will have to take up the tasks that the princess and the pegasi left to run wild. After all, Sumpony will have to regulate the weather to raise the sun and the moon. I blinked. Okay, I've got a new theory. You're a loony. Seriously, the goddess couldn't manage these things, much less an alicorn earth pony. Again he laughed, setting my nerves on edge. Well, then I will fail. But either way, I will be out for your main. You won't have to worry about me any further. And, won't that be nice? Crushing two eggs under one hoof. I really hated the stallion. And, what about your work? I argued. Damn it. The one reason I was all hesitant to take down this monster was because even I could see the good efforts he was eventually going to bring. I could admire what he was building, even if I hated how he was doing it. What about the schools? The hospitals? Rebuilding an infrastructure that will allow Equestria to pull itself out of this post-apocalyptic pit? Red Eye feigned contemplation. Oh dear. Well then, I suppose you'll just have to take my place and see it through. My jaw was on the floor again. Once more, he had blindsided me. How did he keep doing that? You want me to... What? Red Eye smiled. Want you to? Or just expect that you won't let all this just fall apart? Of course, I'm sure you'll try to find a way to accomplish this without the regrettable horrors of slavery. And... With at least the foundation I've managed in place, you might even succeed. He gave me a gracious bow. I certainly hope so. Then added, in a business-like tone, The goddess is still in her home in Maripony. I realized there was another horseshoe waiting to drop. And, so you'll let me go? The black mane cyberpony nodded. Somewhat implicit in the request. Without even looking at Zenith, he added, and you can take your new zebra friend with you. The two of you seem to be effective together. Agree, and she has her freedom. Zenith stared at me with an unfathomable expression. I knew she wanted her freedom enough to risk her life for it, to kill other slaves for it. Was she asking me to accept, or was she warning me about deals with devils. And if I refuse to kill the goddess? Red Eye frowned. Well, I would prefer not to resort to threats. But let's just say that by you succeeding, you will save the lives of your friends in the tower. No! I should never have sent them to that place alone. Oh, goddesses, what have I done? What, what have you done with Calamity, Velvet Remedy, and Steel Hooves? I demanded in a frightened voice. Are they okay? Red Eyes, one real eye blinked. Oh, you mean your assault team at the Philadelphia Tower Station? I sent Stern on ahead with a full squad of her best to give them a warm greeting. I'm sure at least one of them survived. I swallowed hard, feeling all of Equestria fall off from underneath me. I... I want to see them. Red Eye nodded graciously. He tried to do a button on the wall, beneath the large screen. Stern, report. 
I have somebody here who wants to see the captives. The monitor screen lit up. For a moment, all it showed was ruins and blood. Then, a hoof rose up, tapping the screen. Hey! Calamity smiling face, an orange mane, came into view. I think this here just turned on. I could hear the low grumble of Steelhoof's voice. Calamity, don't mess with it. Oh, hold on, Calamity said, looking slightly up. Hey, I can see little Pip through this thing. Hey, you kid! This was obviously not the response Red Eye had been expecting. I felt a crippling surge of relief and collapsed onto the floor. Oh, and you almost be the Red Eye. Can't say it's a pleasure to... Whoa, you're all cyber pony. I didn't expect to see that, even if it were real. Red Eye finally found his voice. Calamity, is it? I take it you've killed. You're welcome to the party? That's who you was expecting? Sorry, but they all can't make it on account of them being mostly blew up. Mostly. We kept your griffin gal all safe and cozy. Trust me, she ain't hardly hurt, and she ain't feeling a bit of pain, Calamity said with mock friendliness. They didn't touch the steel grit in his eyes. Figured things might have gone a bit south for our friend little Pip, so I decided we ought to keep someone for trade. I watched as the drawbridge lowered over the moat. On the other side, through the electrified gate, I could see Velvet Remedy and Steelhooves flanking a thoroughly tussed up and glaring stern. Calamity was sitting sniper in an undisclosed location. I could almost feel the air grow colder when Steelhooves gaze fell upon my striped companion. Red Eye stood next to me, protected inside an alicorn shield. The protecting alicorns were hidden in a sewer passage right beneath us, yet safely out of all a, uh, <clears throat> Calamity's field of view. Remember my offer, little Pip. Kill the goddess, he whispered to me. Clearly, I'm concerned that the goddess's children might hear. Judging from my experience on the roof of Horseshoe Tower, I strongly suspected they couldn't hear anything at all. And you not only get rid of her, but you get rid of me and save your friends in the tower. I blinked, then turned to him with a cross stare. I think we've already established that threat is pretty stupid. I pointed a hoof at my friends, waiting for me on the other side of the gate. Red I cocked his head for a moment. I think he was actually confused. Ah, I apologize for the misunderstanding. I don't mean these friends in that tower, he said, nodding towards the rising white needle of the Philadelphia Tower. I meant your friends in Ten Pony Tower. I felt my blood go cold. Now, I know that damn building has already survived one male firebomb, but do you really think it could survive another? Footnote. Level up. New perk. Gladiator Pony. The action point cost for all unarmed attacks performed in sats is reduced by 10%. Quest perk added. Philadelphia Survivor. Your vicious fights behind the wall in the Philadelphia ruins have left you stronger. Your damage threshold is increased by 2 and your radiation resistance is increased by 3.